I have decided something. What have you decided? I have decided... Stopped. When we're born, we have a mommy and daddy, right? And then when we grow up and get married, we have children of our own. And then our children grow up and get married and have children. And so on and so on. So, it's very important and very fun also to... <laughs> Thank the Lord it's Tuesday so we can talk about sex, baby. This is Miranda, and you're listening to Interesting Sex. I'm so happy you guys are here with me today. Please, if you like this show, go on to Apple Podcasts and subscribe and rate and review. If you don't like my show, then please don't do that, and I don't know why you're listening. But either way, I love you, whether you love me or not. So today I have a really great person that's on. Her name is Hannah Knight. We talk about tantric sex, sex magic, all sorts of rad stuff. And she just had an ebook that came out called How to Be a Badass Goddess, 10 Powerful Steps to Knowing Yourself, Loving Yourself, and Being Yourself Unapologetically. So all you have to do is go to hannahknight.com and click on get my free guidebook. But I'll have that in the show notes. So without further ado, let's open our ears our hearts, and our holes, and let's give a nice and warm welcome to Hannah. Hello? Hi, can I speak to Hannah? This is Hannah. Hi, Hannah. This is Miranda calling from Interesting Sex. Hey, Miranda. How are you doing today? (laughs) I'm doing awesome. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to get like all spiritual with you. Ah, yes, me too. <laughs> Spiritually sexy. Yes. It's kind of what you're into, right? It. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. so why don't you tell us who um you are like as a like as a human, like sexually, how you identify? So, my name is Hannah Knight. I am 23 years old and I identify as a woman. Sexually, like I don't wouldn't say I have any crazy kinks or ways that I identify. I'm pretty open. I just identify as a human. So okay. maybe maybe pansexual would be the right word, but I tend to not identify with labels. I I tend to just want to be as present as possible and not categorize myself. I am a very spiritual person. I think that we all are spiritual beings and human bodies. And so a big part of my journey has been my yoga practice. So I started doing yoga when I was in like middle school. I just happened to come across it and I happened to take classes with a teacher who I still take with. And she's like, I call her my yoga mama because she's basically taught me (laughs) almost everything I know. Um, But she taught um, the tantric philosophy, which was very different from most other yoga classes and still is very different from most other yoga classes um, because she was actually going into like deep ancient spiritual philosophy in every class um, with the themes and uh, alignment principles. And my yoga practice has really opened me up to (sighs) approaching my sexuality in a way that I think most people don't. So let's see in 2013, I did my yoga teacher training. And so I became a yoga teacher. And then this past year, I did a year long training with Layla Martin, who is a sex expert. Um, She studied sexuality at Stanford and she studied Tantra for several years with Tantric masters and gurus in Thailand. And when I did my yoga teacher training, it was tantric philosophy based. So there are kind of two different paths in yoga. Like there's traditional classical yoga, and then there's the tantric approach, which is more underground and more radical. And so I've always kind of been on this more radical side of yoga and spirituality. You know, when most people think of tantra, They think of like hippies in the 60s and 70s, like having spiritual sex, 
which is a part of it, but it's only a small part of it. So Tantra and the Tantric philosophy is really just the idea that we are in a human body living this human experience, but we're spiritual beings and we're connected to the infinite consciousness. So there is this infinite, perfect, whole divine consciousness and it wanted to experience itself. So it manifested into the universe and we are each individual incarnations or manifestations of that divine life source. And so in that, we are here to like play and enjoy and experience and taste the flavors, the nectar of life. Like we're not here to transcend life, which in traditional yoga and, and honestly in a lot of religions, you know, the rules, if I can call them that, it's like, no, like, don't have sex, don't drink alcohol, refrain from this, abstain from this, because we're impure and we need to get rid of those impurities so that we can be more connected to God. But Tantra's like, nope, we already are God, and this whole experience is God. And so by embracing, 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 accepting, 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 we come closer into, we come, we come into our wholeness, that which we already are infinite. And so that whole philosophy is like the, is my lifeblood, like is what I live and breathe. And every day it's, it's an intention that I make to remember the magic, to remember the truth of who I am. And so what I'm exploring now in my sexuality is how can I how can I find that? How can I, how can I bring that into my sexuality? How can I bring my sexuality in to my, to my life? So it's, a, it's an interesting exploration for sure. Yeah. So the Tantra philosophy, is it basically just like do whatever you want whenever you want and it feels good? So I think there are probably many different approaches. There are many different schools of Tantra and I'm not super, I'm not super aware of like all the history. It's a really deep history. But my understanding is that every person has their unique path. So it's really just about what feels the best for you. What is in the most alignment for every individual? Okay. What is, let's just talk about tantric sex. I know it's just a small part of it, but like, Uh, I'm definitely curious on, you know, I hear about that, like it's supposed to like, you can be able to last for hours and all these things, but I don't really know what it is, but I know I want to do it. Yes. (laughs) Yes, me too. I don't know what it is, but I'm in. (laughs) So tantric sex, let's see, one of the major distinctions that I'm finding in my exploration of tantric sex is this idea of orgasm. So the conventional definition of orgasm has something to do with a peak experience, a climax, a buildup, and then a release. Yeah, there's like contraction happening oftentimes in orgasm. It's like stimulation of like a certain part of your body and like then that part of your body like has an orgasm. Like so there's like clitoral orgasm, right? And cervical orgasm and all these different kinds of prostate orgasm. You know, there's really there's really an infinite kind an infinite amount of orgasms. But in Tantra it's really it's really not about the peak. It's not about the climax at all. So rather than like reaching for this like goal, right? So conventional sex is goal oriented, whereas tantric sex is not goal oriented. The intention is to be as goal less as possible and to rather than attempt to attain orgasm to basically like be orgasm. (laughs) So, so you're not trying to have orgasms. You get to have more orgasms. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So there's a lot But of- then it's like it's like me trying to be like, well, if you're not looking for a partner, that's when you'll find your partner. And it's like, but I've tried not looking for a partner before and it didn't work. <laughs> but then you're not really trying. But like if you're not trying to have orgasms to have orgasms. <laughs> well so so yeah, you're you're not trying to have orgasms, right? You're trying to enter an orgasmic state. So the idea is that like bliss and orgasm Bliss and orgasm is our true nature. Like that is my belief that like 
true like consciousness itself, that infinite life source, goddess, God, like whatever you want to call it, the self is bliss. Like it is made of bliss stuff. It is literally orgasmic energy. And so we are too. In tantric sex, you can do it alone or you can do it with a partner. I think it's a lot more powerful with a partner because you're like experiencing intimacy with someone else. You use your energy collectively to become, basically to become really present with that orgasmic energy that already lives within you and like open up the channels. So a lot of tantric sex, you explore the chakras and you basically build up sexual energy, which has immense healing powers. Normally when in conventional sex, all the sexual energy builds up in the lower regions of the body, like in the genitals, in the root chakra. But, but you basically, in tantra, you basically take that energy and you actively cycle it through your body. So you might cycle it up your spine into the crown of your head and then back down the front of your body. Um, that's called the microcosmic orbit. You see that a lot in like Taoist Tantra that basically balances your chakras, opens and refines your energy channel. It can create strength and there are all these different practices you can do. You can also use your sexual energy to like nourish a particular part of your body. Like say you are having, I don't know, like kidney deficiency, like deficiency in one of your organs or something. You can basically take your energy and like visualize it and feel it and send it to that area of your body and feel that it's like nourishing that area of your body. But Ultimately, the idea of tantric sex is to realign with the true essence of who you are. When you talk about like the orbit thing um, from the back of your body up to the front, Mm -hmm. you just do that mentally? You imagine the energy moving around or do you recommend that people maybe like practice it in meditation just to feel how the energy moves or like how do you like start even understanding how to do something like that? Or how to, like, I don't, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it would be first important to understand all the different points in your, in the microcosmic orbit. So there are different points along your spine. You can, it's basically the seven chakras just to simplify it. And are you familiar with the seven chakras? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So if you were doing the, so there are two versions, there's the yin and then there's the yang a direction for the microcosmic orbit. The yang direction is moving up the back of the body and down the front of the body. And this creates more fire. It creates a sense of protection, a sense of strength. If you literally just imagine and feel and breathe, if you do this cycle, like even for five seconds, you will start to feel that strength and that protection. But yeah, I'd say understanding like the seven points. So you would just bring your breath and the energy that you've built up, starting in your perineum, so the point like at the base space of your spine, your root chakra, then you'd bring it up to the back of your second chakra, so like your sacrum and your tailbone. Then you'd bring it up to the back of your solar plexus, then the back of your heart, the back of the pit of your throat, then the occipital ridge, the back of your head, the top of your head, and then just down the same except the front of all those points. So it's pretty simple. It's like, it's not complicated. Like you don't have to know all the details. It helps, but you want to be able to sense stuff, right? So in Tantra, it's all about embodiment. It's about being in the body and fully accessing the power that's like inside of your body. So I think that Tantra and yoga go so well together because yoga helps you become present in your body and like actually feel the sensations. And once you start to feel the sensations, like you're more awakened to emotions that you're holding and blockages that you're holding and tensions that you're holding and energy can move more freely. So I would say like a, maybe a prerequisite to doing something like the microcosmic orbit or Tantra would be having a pretty clear, pretty intimate connection with your body. Like 
people who are dislocated from their bodies and like really in their head might have a harder time connecting with this kind of a thing because they're not feeling the sensations that are happening in their bodies. But yeah, I was thinking a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but some of the people I've been talking to talk about how sex is a spirit, like a way to spirituality for them. And part of me was wondering, um, as someone who enjoys yoga, if it's like, cause when you try to meditate and stuff, it's like trying to get out of your thoughts and then into like your breath or your um, spirit, but to get there, you can't be in your brain. So I was wondering if sex just makes you closer to that because when you're really comfortable with somebody and feeling all these like feelings and you're not really thinking as much, I was wondering if that was part of it for you. Part of this tantric body experience of getting out of your head like yeah or like why do people find that sex is more like if your whole entire experience mm-hmm. is supposed to be orgasmic what does sex bring to it that's different or how does that help you hmm yeah so that's a yeah that's a really good question so actually like when you have sex so there's there's not that much research on like scientific research on sex there should be more but there is some and they've found that like when people, um, have sex when they are in like orgasmic states or even are climaxing, what happens in the brain is that the cortical control. So the outermost layer of the brain, the neocortex, the thinking part of the brain, it actually like turns off, like it shuts down and you're able to access the deeper parts of your brain, the limbic system and the primal part of the brain that are more associated with like emotions and sensations and present moment, like survival instincts, right? Like primal instincts. So, so yeah, it actually, (laughs) you know, you start to breathe heavier and faster. You start to be more aware of your body. So like, right when your primal instincts kick in, like say like, uh, someone or something is like chasing after you, your cortical brain is going to shut off. And your primal instincts are going to tap and you're going to start breathing faster. Your heart's going to start beating. You're going to like lose track of time. You're just going to start running. That's kind of what happens when we have sex. It's another reason why sex is so sensitive and can bring up past trauma and just like make us cry and like make us want to scream and stuff is because a lot of times because we're going into the deeper layers of the psyche and the brain, um, whatever is stored at that level, whether it's like unconscious beliefs or held emotional patterns, those kind of things come up to be resolved. Sex is just such a great healing tool. And that's kind of a lot what I do in my work is I help people as a coach, I help them drop into deeper layers of their psyche through things like self-pleasuring and breath work to activate the limbic and primal system, and then let those unconscious wounds come up and then heal them. So yeah, that I'd say that's just very tantric approach. Cool. So when you work with people as like a sex expert, the sexuality that you studied, but you work on them with it from a healing perspective, or you work on them like with actual, how do you teach somebody how to pleasure themselves? Let's start there. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm not, I don't call myself a sex coach, although a lot of the women who I've gotten to know in the, the year that I did the program did become sex coaches. My like niche is a little bit more nuanced. I'm not really helping people, um, like have good sex lives per se, although that is something that I can help with. It's just like not my particular focus, but Basically, what I do is I help women who have shame and sexual trauma and just like a lot of old conditioning that's keeping them from fully being able to express themselves in the world as their just like most vibrant, authentic, powerful selves. And I I basically, I use sexual and tantric techniques to help them do the healing. But, you know, it's never explicit in our coaching sessions. It's not like we are engaging sexually in any way, but because sex is such a potent healing tool, I'll have them like self-pleasure as homework and 
also create an inner ecology of safety or create an inner ecology of belonging or of love. So when you drop into the deeper layers of the psyche, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're visualizing, or whatever you're feeling becomes like more deeply ingrained because it's like at this deeper level. So we'll do practices like that. I'll do like cathartic release practices, helping them basically release stuck emotions through sounding, through movement, through breath work. Ask me more questions because (laughs) I'm getting lost in my thoughts. Okay, I'm still interested in this microcosmic orbit. So (laughs) as like... um, if you were coaching me right now, if I, you're like, Hey, after this interview, Miranda, why don't you go masturbate? <laughs> like, and then just excuse to masturbate over here. Just kidding. Um, and then I would just like imagine the energy moving around in that way while I masturbate. So what you would do is you would, yeah, you'd start to self pleasure. And, and to be honest, you don't even have to use masturbation. Like you could just use breath. You could just do like you know, tender caresses or anything that just brings pleasure, right? It doesn't have to be like sex kind of pleasure, but, okay. but just for the sake of your question, yes, you'd build up sexual energy until you're like really turned on and you, you don't climax, right? So climax actually like you're releasing energy. So it'd be kind of silly to like build up all this energy and then just like release it, which is normally what we do. So instead of doing that, you take all that energy that's built up and really feel the sensations. Like where is it in your body? You know, you can visualize it if you're a visual person or you can just feel into it if you're more kinesthetic. And then you imagine it. I like to imagine it as a bright white or golden or rainbow ball of light. And then you take that energy yeah, and you just move it with your breath and with your mind and really feel it moving and you can move really slow. Like you can stop at every point just to like really feel like you're tapping into each of the points in your spine. Um, but once you kind of feel it and you're like really dropped into the felt sense, the physical sensations, you can move fast, like through the cycles, just really like inhaling up, exhaling down Mm -hmm. inhaling up. And I forgot though, what is that supposed to do? Well, what it does is it circulates healing energy through your body. Okay. So yeah, it opens your chakras. It just helps you connect to your body. It, it basically opens up energetic, like channels. Okay. And then once that healing energy is moving through your body, then you can send it somewhere. Once the healing energy is moving through your body. Yeah. So there, so, so the microcosmic orbit is just one practice. Okay. You can also add, you could also add on that other thing of like healing it, healing a particular part of your body. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that after you do the microcosmic orbit, or you could do it before, too. Okay. It's really fun because you can just be creative. It's just yummy, healthy, delicious sexual energy, and you're just playing, So right? do you um, pleasure yourself in some way every day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are, you know, of course there are days when I'm just, like, busy and I forget or I don't make the time for myself, but... Yeah, like in an ideal week or month, I self-pleasure every day, whether it's masturbating, whether it's dancing in my room, or like I love to put oils on my body. I love to engage my senses with essential oils and candles. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Fun. Okay. So you've mentioned to me before something called a sex magic. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me what sex magic is? <laughs> okay, so it's it's actually quite similar to the microcosmic orbit, but what you're doing is you're taking sexual energy. So you can do this while you're having sex with a partner or partners, or you can do it alone. Um, but you basically have sex or you masturbate and you build up all this pleasure and you take that pleasure that's built up usually in your like genitals and lower region. And you move it one by one through each chakra. And this process is like a little bit more, it would probably take a little bit longer than the microcosmic orbit. It's more of a ritual, right? So you move it through each chakra, really feeling like that you're activating each chakra. And then you basically keep going until you reach the crown of your head. And before you start this ritual, right, you have an intention. You have something that you want to manifest. 
So that's the purpose of sex magic is basically to give like magical energy to what it is that you want, whether it's like, Oh, I want to make $50,000 this month. Um, or I really want to manifest my soulmate. And so you bring your energy and you keep building your energy till it's like really, really strong, bring it to the crown of your head. And then once you reach the crown of the head, you shoot your energy out the top of your head and basically send it out into the universe. And as you do this, you visualize what you want as though you already have it. And so this is another process that I take my clients through a lot of the time. It's called five senses reality. So five senses reality is when you visualize what you want as though it, you already have it through the five senses. So you see it, you hear it, like what's being said, what sounds do you hear? What are you saying? You feel it. So what are you touching in this experience? What do you feel in your body in this experience? You uh, taste it. What do you taste as you have this experience? And then you smell. So what do you smell as you know that you're, you know, you have what you want. And so you shoot it out to the universe and you immerse yourself in the five senses reality of what you want. And you feel that the universe is like, yes, yes, you have this. And then you let the energy come back down through the crown of your head and you let it settle through your whole body coming back down through each of the chakras. And that's basically the ritual, but you want to like, you can climax, which is really cool. I like to when you shoot it out the top of your head, like just climax at that moment, like, yes, it's like this (laughs) really static moment (laughs) where you're like, yes, I have everything I want. It feels so good. And like on a, like on a scientific level, like what's probably happening, there's not research on this, but like what's probably happening is like you enter this state of pleasure. And when you, when you're in pleasure, you're in safety, right? Like most of it, like when you're in a state of like, Oh my God, everything's amazing. Like you feel safe. And so when you feel that way and you're visualizing what you want, it lets your brain and body know that it's safe to have what you want. Cause most of the time, the reason why we don't have what we want is because there's a feeling of unsafety in our brains. That's like, no, you can't have that. No, that's not safe. So that's kind of like what's going on beneath the layers. And the reason why we breathe it through the chakras is because each chakra is correlated with a different part of the brain. So when we bring the activation to the different parts, uh, the different chakras, we're actually like activating many different parts of the brain. So when we want something and we're like, you know, just thinking to ourselves like, oh, I want this thing, or we're maybe even visualizing it, we're usually only accessing the cortical part of the brain. Like we're only kind of projecting that with this one type of the brain, one part of the brain. So this practice really lets your desire and your embodiment be like truly, truly full body. It's really powerful. That's cool. A real quick break right here. I found this amazing book that I have to plug. It's called While You Are Pooping. It's an inappropriate children's book for adults. Everyone is naked in the pictures. It has drawings of like sex and every page is something that happens in the world while you were on the pooper. It is really funny. It makes a great gift or you can just put it in your own guest bathroom for when you have friends over. Totally recommend it. You can find it on interestingsexpodcast.com. You can find it on Amazon Let's support the small artists that are weird out there because we know we are weird, which is why we're listening to this podcast. Love you, bitches. Back to the show. You mentioned partner or partners. Yes. Do you find yourself in a lot of threesomes? (laughs) (laughs) I, I don't find myself in a lot of threesomes, but I have had experiences with multiple partners and it is very, very fun. Okay. And I can just imagine me like dating someone and being like, Hey, let's do this like sex magic thing. And then thinking I'm probably crazy. I feel like it takes a very specific kind of guy to be open to all this or even be able to understand it. Like, where do you find your boyfriends? (laughs) (laughs) So I don't think the average guy, like they might want to be open to it, but I don't know if they really care. Yeah. I think that 
I think that's a really good point. I think that most men that I've come across aren't necessarily open to this kind of, or they're just not aware of this kind of thing. But I love the term initiatress. Um, it's a term that Layla Martin uses a lot and just women that I'm friends with use. As a woman, we have this unique gift and unique wisdom. And for the most part, at least in my experience, like my journey is so different than that of a man. I'm, I'm so connected to my body. I really care about compassion. I really care about our connection to each other and connection to the earth. And a lot of men are, are really disconnected from that. I think from birth, it happens, and this is just like a total other tangent, but like a lot of men are circumcised at birth, which is an immediate traumatic experience for males that I don't think they even realize they're carrying that connects, disconnects them from their bodies and from their feelings. Um, cause you know, men are taught to be really tough and really strong and not show emotion. So I think, you know, as a woman, I, I want to be an initiatress. I want to be someone who says, this is what I know. And I'm going to lead you like, let me open you up. So it's magic. like being a dominatrix, but with initiation. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think that people want to be in bliss and people want to be connected to their truth and people want to live a beautiful life. And I think it just takes extreme vulnerability, just so much vulnerability to admit that. And, and if you have the tools, share them because they're not accessible everywhere. Like, so yeah, I think that even if someone see a man seems like, oh, I don't think he would really care about this, or like, oh, I don't, I don't know, he might not be interested in it. Yeah, he might not be interested in it, but like, if you show, if you initiate him into the magic of it, like, good stuff could happen. And I'm reading this book. It's called Tantric Orgasm for Women by Diane Richardson, and she talks a lot about this. And but she has so many testimonials from men who were like. I never thought that I would be into this. Like I thought this was so weird, but like it seriously changed my life and like I'll never go back to like having sex in another way. And I think that, I think that is so important that we all experience these new ways of being sexual. Well, you also don't want to be with someone that's going to come too soon either because you got to get through all these things. So I guess that's that's what the practice is, is trying to get to that point where... Like, you know, the first time and the guy comes in like under a minute and you're like, great. <laughs> but yes. then they have to, once they get used to you, it, they get a little bit better. At, yeah. So I guess that's part of like why it takes so much practice. Yeah, it's definitely a practice. <laughs> um, I think everyone knows, like when they think of tantric sex, I always like think of Sting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So like he goes like hours. I think like just having sex, he can like do it for like a day. Yes. Uh, I want to meet Sting. He had a interview where he and his wife, um, Trudy, allegedly had eight hour love making sessions. If we had seven hours, I would demonstrate, Sting said, to huge laughs and cheers. So I think they do it for like eight hours. Oh my gosh, that is my dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a man, you really have to learn how to not get overexcited. Yeah. You know, and it takes a really special kind of man to be able to sustain that kind of focus and that kind of energy, right? Because just like you were saying, most men come really easily. Right. And And for uh, them, I think usually that is the goal or once they come, they want to be done where it's like, but like, I'm not, I want more. Like just because I had one orgasm doesn't mean I don't want to have three more. Yeah. And it's like, I don't care if you're done. Like this isn't like, let's make this a thing. (laughs) Right. Like let's, let's experience bliss for as long as possible. Right. (laughs) And I have been learning about too, how men can have multiple orgasms like on top of each other and they get better and better. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something different than tantric, but maybe similar in practice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely similar. It's, 
it's retaining the semen. So when you ejaculate, when a man ejaculates, like it's a biological release, like in the intention behind that is to produce a living creature, a living human baby child. But in tantric sex, in eight hour long sex, that kind of experience, the intention is to maintain your energy, to sustain it. And so coming is just totally, it doesn't serve healing. It doesn't serve bliss. It's yeah. yeah. The next time I hate, I've been joking with my friends lately. I hate it when people say like anything about their load. I find it like so gross when people <laughs> refer to it as like a load. And so next somebody says something like, I'm saving my load for you or something. Cause I like makes me want to puke. I'm going to say, can you please just say retaining your semen? <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that before. And that is so funny. Retaining your semen. <laughs> I probably got that from the book I'm reading. She talks a lot about using like the actual words, like instead of using like pussy or yo- or even yoni, like she talks about just using the word vagina and instead of using like dick or cock to use the word penis, because it actually, it's just like the most clear way of communicating. And yeah. like, it actually helps people drop into their actual bodies rather than this idea oh. of what bodies are. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's like, to me, when I read that, I was like, oh, I resonate with that. I would like to try that. <laughs> yeah. Say you want to just have a quickie, like, do you think that's still fun and cool and all? Or do you try to have like some sort of spiritual feeling every time you have sex? Or can sometimes it just be like dirty and raunchy and bad and fun? Yeah, I'm I'm totally down with dirty and raunchy and bad and fun. <laughs> I think it all is just, it's all a journey. It's all about like, what is the most alive? I just don't like forcing things. Like I just don't like being inauthentic. It feels so gross to me when like the person I'm having sex with just, uh, I can just tell they're just so ingrained in this like conventional way of having sex of like, Oh, it ha- like we have to be like hot in this kind of way. And like these kind of things like need to be done. It's just like such a conventional expression of sex. And like, I think that's totally, totally fine. Like if I'm feeling that in the moment, which definitely sometimes happens, but like most of the time I kind of want something more. And I've been thinking a lot about this idea. I need you to, um, make this more clear. Oh, okay. Like I want descriptions of what conventional is versus what you need is more. So yeah, like conventional, conventionally, there's this obsession with everything being like fast and hard and, you know, even just the whole sexual experience, like happening really fast. Um, like this idea of like hotness and passion and like, let's just fuck right now. And like, I think that can be really nice, but like for me personally, my body right now, just like, especially having done all this healing work, um, over the past couple of years, looking at my trauma and stuff like that, like my body just doesn't respond to that anymore. I don't find it nourishing. It, it's a somewhat draining and, you know, acting hot and like trying to be like this hot, like, I don't know, woman and like. You are such a hot woman though. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just really want to have intimate experiences with people. Like my, my turn on is like, tell me that you're feeling nervous. <laughs> like, tell me that what you really want, like be vulnerable. Like that is such a turn on to me and ask me like how I'm feeling and, and hold space for me when I tell you like, I'm not turned on or like honor my body, honor that my body doesn't want this right now or honor. I just think that the honoring right now in my life is just so, so important to me. And yeah, I've been thinking a lot about like the seasons, the sexual seasons, or, um, what my teacher calls the sexual life cycle, life cycles. So, you know, winter, um, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And we all go through those stages. So if you think of like a sexual experience, there's a spring, there's a turn on, it's, you know, it's starting to get warmer. You're starting to have desire. You're starting to get like sexy. And then there's a summer usually, which is like, 
the hottest of the hottest, the wettest of the wettest, like, you know, the climax, the, what, that's what most of us in our society are reaching for. And then after that, there's a fall. I mean, there's just a natural energy drop. It's like, you can't just keep orgasming forever as much. Like you can't keep climaxing forever as much as like, we all want that. There's just going to be death. Like it's done. And so you have, it's like an honoring of the fall and then, um, a winter, which is like the time when it's still, there's no desire. There's no, there's no more sex. It's just presence. And that time is necessary to rebuild the energy. And so what I've been thinking about a lot lately is just like honoring each of those parts of the cycle. And as I've started to explore this idea, I'm finding that like, wow, I really have an attachment to spring and to summer, like most of us. And I, do, I have a hard time honoring fall and winter. There are days where like, I literally, I'm not turned on. And like, that's fucking okay. Like, I don't need to be turned on all the time. And it's actually really beautiful to honor the times when I'm not. So I really want to be with a partner or partners who recognize that in me and in themselves as well and can just honor it all. Yeah. Once you, I mean, once you went over the seasons, I found it interesting that I immediately was like, oh, I fucking love the winter because <laughs> like, well, I only really have the winter like after I had good sex. And then like the next day you're just like, you walk better, you feel better. You're not like crazy, horny, obsessed with anything. You're just kind of chilling and you just feel good. Because once I get, I guess, to the spring, like it's hard to think about anything else or for me to get anything done <laughs> until, <laughs> until you get this to happen. And if you don't have a boyfriend, it can become obsessive because you're like, oh no, what do I do? You know, and this is not going to leave my head. So anyway, yeah. I love the winter. I love it after a really good lay. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then you can get things done. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Thank you for <laughs> applying that to your life. Yeah. Who would have thought? I love the winter, but I also get obsessive, I guess, in the, in the spring time. Yeah. In my sexual spring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we all, we all are in different places and we all have different, like weird attachments to different seasons. And, yeah. 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 So I guess appreciating all of them. Do you mind talking a little bit about your trauma? No. Oh. I don't mind. You mentioned that right now you like to um, be somewhere that is like a little bit more nourishing because of all the work that you went through, through your trauma. So I was just curious because I think it's important for people to be able to talk about it and to realize the people that might be listening that their traumas are okay. And you sound like you have it all like figured out. And then you said that, and I was like, Oh, I wonder what she went through that got her to the place that she is specifically now as a person and your path. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, we all have trauma and we all have different degrees of trauma, but we all have it. And anything can be traumatic depending on just your experience of it. So it's hard to pinpoint like what events in my life really led to this, this me, but certainly my sexual experiences in the beginning were not very nourishing or loving. And I just think that we live in a culture where sex is perverted. We're obsessed and we don't know how to we don't know how to love each other. We don't know how to love our bodies. We don't know how to respect um, each other. And I spent a lot of time in high school and in middle school um, partying and drinking. So there was always a lot of alcohol involved. And a lot of my sexual experiences were just drunken. It was just drunk sex. And, you know, there were several occasions which I was raped and that word is so strong, so I don't like to use it. And here I am. As I say this, I feel like someone else is going to be like, no, no, you need to validate you know, what happened. But I just kind of want to say that I feel just as responsible for what happened as I feel that the other people involved were. There was alcohol involved. I, I think that we're just not taught 
we're not taught how to listen to our bodies, how to honor them. And even though the experiences that I had weren't necessarily violent, like weren't necessarily like really physically, you know, the kind of thing that you might see on a movie, like, you know, scary, there is a subtle level of violence that happens when boundaries are broken. Like that, that is violence and our bodies retain that violence. And I just spent a lot of time after, you know, throughout my whole high school and even into college having the kind of sex that felt on an energetic and subtle level violent. Like it felt obtrusive and abusive. And I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to say stop. I didn't know, I didn't know anything really about my sexuality because I was just never taught. Um, Other than you didn't know, do you think you consciously knew you didn't want it and you didn't know really how to say anything? Yes. 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 And nobody really asked you. Because you would and get no yourself one really in these asked me. situations and that you weren't strong enough or comfortable enough to say something. Yeah, so you exactly. just get, let yourself be taken. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there were times when I said stuff and I wasn't respected. Okay. You know, it's this thing that happens. It's, it's, it's a natural uh, reaction that we all experience. It's called freeze. And when we can't, so there's fight, flight, and freeze. There's survival instincts when there's danger. Fight would be like, you know, fighting, literally fighting someone off. Flight would be literally running away. And both of those things in our culture are taboo. So as humans, one of the most common responses in dangerous situations is freeze. And that's why a lot of women, people are like, well, why didn't she say, why didn't she say anything? Um, She didn't directly say no or whatever. It's because she was frozen. She didn't know, like her survival instinct was to play dead, basically, because that was the safest option for her at the time. And I think that that's kind of what I was going through. I was like, well, it's too risky to like really stand up for myself in this moment. So I'm just going to like go with it. And I think this is a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. And, and, and I grew up in a Christian home that was like really traditional conservative and I was just very confused about my sexuality as a, as a teen and young, like young twenties. I wanted to explore it because I knew that I had the right to do that, but I also felt all this guilt and all this shame. So even just my upbringing within the Christian church and like hearing that my body belongs to God and hearing that like, I will go to hell if I have sex before marriage and like hearing that kind of thing was traumatic too. So just all these different layers, all these, all these emotions. And on top of that, all the relationship drama that happened, I've been in so many different relationships and just, there's been so much heartbreak and all of the things that we've experienced, like, even if it's not sexual, if it's just relationship, if it's just with your family or with your friends, like it's all stored in your body. It's all stored in your body unless it's been healed. And that's the stuff that comes up in sex and in relationship. And so, but yeah, I didn't, there was an experience that I had in high school where I, you know, was sexually assaulted and I didn't realize what had happened until like two years later when I was in college. And I was like, Whoa, like, Whoa, that actually happened. And that was a thing. And I never took it seriously until just now. Like I didn't even realize, um, that that has impacted me. Yeah. So it's a constant unveiling. Yeah. When I was, um, my first, when I was 17 was 27 and, um, he would say like, I love you and stuff to me. And I would say it back eventually. And then I realized like later, I don't even count him as my first love because I realized like this was completely inappropriate. (laughs) Like, like I wasn't even like mentally prepared for any of this. And he was, when I was 27, the amount of knowledge that you have that is different than what a 17 year old understands about love and sex in their body is crazy. And then I was like, Oh, that's why Sagittarius rape exists. You really don't even have when you're in high school, you don't like have this under everything is so overwhelming. You have no grasp or understanding and you go crazy. Yeah. People really do like take advantage of that. Yeah. In general. Um, Yeah. Whether they realize they're doing it or not. I don't know. It's tricky. I'm okay. This is a question that I forgot um, to write down. But when you're doing sex magic, I imagine that you should be on top 
<laughs> because if you're like riding them, then you can go out more and they're not in the way of where you're sending it. Because if they're on top of you and the wall's like behind you, your energy is just shooting into the wall or getting blocked by this like motherfucker. Yeah. No, it doesn't <laughs> matter. position you I like? Mean, whatever position is like most comfortable, right? Like, right. I think, yeah, sitting would be, you know, with your spine tall would be helpful, but you could also be lying down. Right. And I don't think it matters at all. Okay. But if you're lying down, I think you shouldn't be facing a wall. It should be like facing like the opposite so side like of the wall. You should be like outside. You right. should be you like should be outside or at least like towards a window, like instead of the wall. So you're thing. <laughs> and then I wonder if you even like, do you have to love the person or can you just like not be look? Cause if you're looking at them and you're like, I don't even really like you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, are you doing this just alone and they're just like, uh, they're just like helping you out or like, ideally they are doing it too. <laughs> yeah, but when I want to start practicing this, like, like tomorrow and then I don't know the person. <laughs> I don't think it matters. I'll just be like, do it from behind. I don't want to look at you. <laughs> I'm doing this for me, buddy. <laughs> I don't think it really matters. I guess that silly. sounds fine. I don't see why that wouldn't work. <laughs> just being silly but over I don't here. think the wall is going to get in the way. I think the universe, it can still receive your message. Okay. Yes. <laughs> good to know. Like Santa, he can, exactly. he always knows if you're good or bad. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I do like to talk to people about sexual experiences that they have not had and want to have in the same kind of way that I think it might also help put it in the universe for you to get that sexual experience too. Cause if people don't know, you might not get it. Uh, yeah. So let's send out some <laughs> sex magic love right now into your sexual bucket list. Hmm. Uh-huh. I thought really hard about this question and you know, I really do think that, you know, at first I was going to say like there's, so there's this guy who does shamanic, like shamanic journeys with shibari rope. So it's like, he ties you up, but, and he's like a trauma specialist too. Like he's trauma trained. So he takes you through like a healing integration journey, which sounds really amazing. And that's definitely on the list. But if I really be super present. If I'm really super present with myself and like what I truly desire right now that I haven't experienced, it would definitely be like, you know, eight hours of tantric lovemaking, um, with someone else who is just like so present with me. Yeah. What I really desire is just deep, deep healing. Do you think that you can stay wet for that long? Like, cause you know, like it starts, <laughs> you know, I wonder if you got to like how does that, I wonder how that works. I, I think it's an ebb and flow. And, you know, I've done some studying with this as well. It's like, well, a guy can't stay hard for that long. Like it's important for our bodies to know and feel safe that they can, like he can get soft and it's okay. And then like he can get hard again and then like he can go soft and like, it's not really a big deal. And like, you don't have to like pull out just cause you're soft. Like that's basically still sex. Like, and you don't have to move either. Like you don't have to, there doesn't have to be like penetration. Um, there doesn't have to be like this thing that we consider sex. And Diane Richardson talks about this a lot. So they could the be book. soft and still inside you, but then they could yeah. just be kissing you and, and like, touching your boobies and returning you on again while yeah. your body becomes more ready to continue the experience. Yeah, exactly. It's a whole body experience. So touching any part of my body and kissing and talking and bre doing breath work together. And you can also do like, it's called de armoring. Like you can actually use, like he can use his penis to release physical tension that's held inside. But I'm talking about like subtle, subtle, energetic, like trauma that's stored okay. inside of the physical body. You can bring like the head of the penis to that area and like hold it there and breathe there. And you might experience like pain and then you can experience release and kind of like integrate trauma. So that's the kind of experience like I would like to have. Um, wait, really quick. Do you mean like they can, like if you have pain in your neck, they'd put their penis on your neck? <laughs> 
and like point it out of it. <laughs> That's not what I mean, okay. but <laughs> I'm talking about like. But let's impact. try it because you never know. I, I'm down. I'm so down to try it. <laughs> Can you massage my feet with your dick? Because they hurt. <laughs> your magic wand, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god if I had a dick I would just be so silly with it all the time you have a strap on no you can get a strap on and put it on and then just act like you have a dick that is a good idea yeah I like this idea <laughs> one day I will have a strap on yeah. do you have a strap on I don't I really have been wanting one yeah because I want to do the same thing I just want to like I just want to feel what it's like to have a dick and I just think it sounds really fun. Well, let's add that to your bucket list too. Yes. But yeah. do you want to um, peg a guy or would you like to be with a woman with your dick or, or do you just want to like walk around with it in your pants? I would like to, yeah, I would like to penetrate a man. Me too. I think that sounds amazing. Well, I am really happy that we had this talk today, and I think that it's really great how different it feels in a lot of my other episodes, because a lot of times my other episodes are kind of like what you talk about. It's like, it is like kinky and intense and lots of bells and whistles where like, it's also good to be reminded about like the really intense energy and connection and spirituality and inner healing that's also found within sex and whatever guy or guys or however you decide to live your life it's going to be super lucky to get you oh thank you yeah this has been such a pleasure thank you for having me on your podcast yes well do you have an instagram or anything that you need to tell people about to where they can find you so the best way to find me would just be my website which is hannah-knight.com yeah it's h-a-n-n-a-h dash k-n-i-g-h-t Dot com and I will ha- soon have a free ebook that I'm writing that'll be up and so you can sign up to receive that it's called um, becoming a badass goddess that's um, so rad yeah when it was it all coming out do you know exercises in it there will also be a link in the show notes and I can add that in so as well as there will be a link in the show notes to your website Yay. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Please keep me updated on anything. If you want to go strap on shopping, um, <laughs> we could do that together. <laughs> I'm so down. We Let's can like pick that. out what kind of dicks we would have. And I'd be like, I don't know. I think your dick might be a little bit more purple than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining like a light blue. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. I love her. What a powerful, what a powerful lady and such like amazing messages. I hope you guys start bringing this into your practice, whether it is in kink or just not in kink, but you can find ways to use your energy and your strength when you're connecting with your partner, no matter the kind of sex you decide to have. Love that. Anyway, don't forget, go check out her ebook, How to Be a Badass Goddess, 10 Powerful Steps to Knowing Yourself, Loving Yourself, and Being Yourself Unapologetically, hannah-knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, dot com. Don't forget that we are super, super duper lucky to get to have sex how and with who we want, and we are very fortunate. A lot of people in this world do not ever have that choice, 10% of any profits from interesting sex podcast will go to help stop sex and human trafficking. I can't think of anything worse than a child being sex trafficked. Thank you again for being here, guys. If you think you have interesting sex and you want to let me know about it and maybe even be on the show, please send me an email at interestingsexpodcast at gmail.com or go to interestingsexpodcast.com. Also find me on Instagram. Love you. Peace out. See you next Tuesday to find out what the pussy drags in. And let me tell you, This pussy is dragging in a bad ass chick. Thank you to the band 41 for this fun song. 41music.net.